The Jamaica Baptist Union welcomes you to the online Bible study series, Keeping Faith with the Word, presented by the President of the Jamaica Baptist Union, the Rev. Norva Rodney. If you have any questions for our presenter, feel free to ask your question proceeding with at Rev in the chat or comment. Welcome again, my friends, to another in the series of Bible study sessions. We are delighted to have you on this journey as we seek to unpack the Jamaica Baptist Union theme for 2020 to 2030. We apologize for the not so clear audio of the previous session. But as the Lord enables, we are committed to improving as we press on. In that initial presentation, we sought to locate the theme in context to justify its relevance in these COVID-19 times and to begin the process of exploring what keeping faith really implies. In referencing the book of Daniel, we drew inspiration from ways in which Daniel in particular and the Hebrew people exiled in Babylon in general kept faith amidst formidable odds. You will recall that against that background, we discern that this thematic call is inviting us to consider matters which have to do with identity, integrity, mystery, poverty, and community. We will get back to these in the not too distant future. In today's session, however, the identity of the word comes into sharp focus since it is a subject around which we are being called to demonstrate a particular spirituality. Recall the theme. Keeping faith with the word. With the word in an ever-changing world. Clearly, we need to spend some time answering the question, what really is the word? May I invite you to pray with me. Let us pray. In humility, sovereign Lord, we bow in your awesome presence. We confess our, divine, our need for divine enabling as we seek after your truth. So grant divine light so that we may truly see and divine love so that we may be truly free. For we pray in Jesus' name. Sisters and brothers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we can learn much from the language and the culture of our Jewish antecedents. For them, the Hebrew word dava, spelled D-A-B-A-R, as a noun means word and as a verb to speak. Allow me to read a brief excerpt from Abarim Publications' Biblical Dictionary, which I believe will help us to appreciate the dynamic nature of the word, word. The verb dava means to formalize, to deliberately establish and pronounce something's name or definition. This causes the thing to become real in the mind of whoever understands this word, name, or definition. And this in turn explains why all of creation was spoken into being. This principle sits at the base of nominal reasoning and thus human awareness and ultimately information technology. Clearly from that expression you can conclude that there is something dynamic and transforming about the word of God. That leads me easily into speaking to you about the first feature, the first character of the word. I want to speak to you first about the active word. The active word. The testimony of the earliest expressions in Old Testament allows for us to conclude that God's word is a standard by which all other expressions are judged. Recall this, that God spoke and the universe came into being. Recall also that the Old Testament insists on the active word 
as the means of creation. Psalm 33 verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and their starry host by the breath of his mouth. The New Testament holds the word as essential, as cardinal to our Christian faith and understanding. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 11 verse 3 declares, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Friends, God's word will effect its purpose as surely as the snow and the rain effect theirs. If you read Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 to 12, this is how it reads almost poetically. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. It's not by mistake that from as early as Deuteronomy, in chapter 9 and verse 5, we read such that allows for us to conclude that when God fulfills a promise, God performs God's word. All of the foregoing put together, I believe, has helped the writer to the Hebrews to write these immortal words in chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged two sword, double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Clearly, the word of God is powerful. It is active, it is dynamic, it is here to make a difference. So let me move on and speak about another concept which is at the heart of our understanding this dynamic reality called the Word. We are speaking now about the Word as revelation. The Word as revelation. The idea of word as that which has been revealed is best understood against the background of the message of the message of the prophets. Recall that in the days of the judges the word of the Lord had not been revealed as I spoke to you about last time and cited the situation when Samuel heard the Lord speaking to him. And we read in 1 Samuel chapter 3 that in those days the word of the Lord was rare. Yes, in the days of Judges, the word of the Lord had not been revealed to Samuel. But later on in Israel's history, we read that the word came. That is to say, the word of God was revealed to prophets like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and Joel, and may have been an object of vision to them. Who can forget that when God's children were exiled in Babylon, and Ezekiel had a vision of them looking as a people who were despairing and hopeless, what was it that made the difference? Ezekiel heard God's word, and Ezekiel spoke, Hear the word of the Lord. My friends, when the prophets cried, Hear the word, as Amos and others did, they were declaring a revelation which was destined for a historic fulfillment. For God's word is settled in heaven, according to the psalmist in Psalm 119 and verse 89. The, the strains of that popular song comes to my mind. It's done. 
it's already done. The psalmist put it this way. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. We also note that the covenant between God and Israel was predicated and guided by God's revelatory word. So that in Psalm 119, the psalmist says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. And in verse 130 of that same chapter, the psalmist declares, The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. This same concept of the word as revelation is present as it regards Jesus Christ himself, who is God's final, God's most fulsome word of salvation, revealed as the Logos, as the Logos, the living word. In St. John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14, we have two of the most eloquent and two of the most powerful verses in scripture. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And as if that is not enough, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word, the living word was revealed to us in, in, in human eyes we saw we saw him with our eyes and indeed he was full of grace and truth how then can we tie this up the word as revelation spoken first to us in the Old Testament has been completely perfectly and fully manifested in Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ God has spoken in different ways throughout the generations but in these days he speaks to us through the living word his son what an amazing God we serve it leads us to contemplate the significance of the word that is active that is revealed the significance of this word to us as we have our existence in this world and this then takes me to contemplate the word as gospel the word as good news for all the foregoing all that i've said serves to confirm that the word of god is critical to our salvation the word of god is critical to our salvation you pick that up when you read the scriptures and Isaiah chapter 55 brings it out clearly. For in that chapter, the, the context of Isaiah 55 relates to the possibility of pardon for the penitent. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. In that same chapter, the prophetic word speaks of grace. And mercy as well or uh, as well as of wrath and judgment the saving word of God is also personified and spoken of as being sent by God to heal to save to deliver his people Psalm 107 he sent forth his word and it healed them God sent forth his word and it delivered, it saved and continues to save God's people. In the New Testament we go again and we go to 1 Peter chapter 1. In that chapter it seems as if Peter was just intent on communicating that the word of our God endures forever because it is the gospel and it is by the word of God the gospel that we enter into a born again experience in other words there can be no authentic salvation without 
the word of God. It is absolutely critical for our salvation experience. How do we bring this exploration of the word to a close? How do we tidy up this and tie it up together? Well, I would say this, that biblical usage of the word appears under several forms, yet with an overall consistency. The word of God is God's self-communication. God spoke by the prophets. God has spoken by scriptures. Scriptures is God's revealed word. God has spoken by God's Son, Jesus. Jesus Christ is the word that became flesh. The gospel, the doctrine of salvation, and the preaching of Christ are all God's word. And in all these cases, the word of God is active, saving, and judging. Sisters, brothers, and friends, this is the awesome resource. This is the power with which we are summoned by God to keep faith. Keep faith with the word. This is what we are being called to give our highest loyalty and commitment to, especially in these changing times. The word is the active, creative, effective, authoritative expression of God's own sovereign will and purpose. The word is it eternally, completely, and perfectly embodied in and manifested by Christ Jesus the Lord. The scriptures are the written record and witness of the revelation, uniquely equipped for such a purpose by the Holy Spirit. The question I'd like to ask, how can we not accept this call to keep faith with the word? I would want to invite you to transition with me for a brief moment. For the rest of this presentation, I want to pull together the two subtopics that we have looked at so far, keeping faith and the word, and ask the question, what's the implication of this for us? And I answer the question by saying it has much to do in terms of issues of obedience and disobedience. Keeping faith with the word, implications for obedience and disobedience. And again, we commence by going back and coming forward. And we make a deduction from our reading of the epistles of the Hebrews. For that document, features an impassioned plea by the writer for his audience to keep faith with the word. In the process, they were to guard against drifting, defecting, degenerating, despising, and denying that which was foundational to their faith. What is it? The word of God. If the above is true, then it goes to say, that to refuse to obey the voice of God in Hebrews means these three things. It means to reject Jesus as sovereign, to disregard him as high priest, and to deny the gracious provisions of the new covenant. On the other hand, to hear or obey the word of God means to acknowledge Jesus as leader, and to follow him into God's rest. It means to confess Jesus as high priest and draw near with confidence because of his intercessions into the presence of God. And it means that we are owning the provisions of the new covenant 
by embracing the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ and all that comes with that. It goes without saying that the stakes for obedience are very high. On the one hand, the rewards are exceedingly generous. For God offers faithful believers far better promises than those offered under the first covenant. According to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, the, the author asserts that, quote, it is impossible that God would prove false to his promises so that we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. For those who take refuge in God, God always lives to make intercessions for them. On the other hand, the penalties are severe. And the writer of Hebrews warns the writers, the readers, about the dire consequences of disobedience. In verse, verse 4 of chapter 8 and verse 10, on verse 27 of chapter 10, we pull those two together and we come to this conclusion that it is impossible to restore to repentance those who spurn the Son of God and hold him up to contempt. They will suffer a fearful prospect of judgment. Disobedience of God's word implies the rejection of of Jesus as sovereign. It implies the rejection of him as the great high priest and the provision, the provisions of the new covenant. In other words, it means that we are rejecting the grace of God. By answering the question, what does this have to do with us? What is the contemporary relevance of the word that we have explored in such depth and detail? What does this have to do with us? I will simply put it this way. That the promises and warnings of Hebrews are especially relevant for us in the 21st century. Right here and right now. The temptation exists, my friends, for us to think that those who heard Jesus speak and saw him perform miracles have a greater responsibility than we who have met him only through the words of Scripture. The writer to the Hebrews argues the opposite. For him, those who, to whom he penned his letter had not heard God speak at Mount Sinai or heard Jesus while he was on earth. Yet, they have greater responsibility because they hear God's voice speaking to them through scripture. This is the most striking teaching of Hebrews regarding obedience. The writer places the authority of scriptures over the authority of sense experience. For him, what we hear through scripture is more authoritative than what we see, what we touch, what we hear or taste as a result of our senses. Biblical scholar Timothy Johnson is correct in his conclusion. This is what he says. Scripture is not simply a collection of ancient text that can throw light on the present through analogy. Scripture is the voice of the living God who speaks through the text directly and urgently to people in the present. The word of God is therefore living and active. Therefore, Hebrews warning continues to be relevant for us 
for us who hear today God speaking to us in the scriptures. For according to chapter 12 and verse 25, if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? In a nutshell, what have we been saying? We are saying that from the testimony of the Hebrew scriptures, we can infer, we can conclude that the call to keep faith with the word carries awesome implications. We are saying that obedience to the word of God is absolutely critical. The rewards are great and the penalties for disobedience are severe. We are saying that the authority of scripture trumps the authority of our sense experiences. For what we hear through the scriptures is far more authoritative than what we see, what we touch, what we hear, or taste through our senses. It therefore behoves us, my friends, to keep faith with the word. Thank you for sharing once again in this exploration of God's word and may God richly bless you. Amen. We thank you for sharing in our online Bible study series, Keeping Faith with the Word. Remember, if you have any questions for a presenter, comment below. Until next time, the peace of God be with you.